Hi, Rosie. It is lovely to have you back here. Thank you for joining us again. No, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Adenomyosis. For those that are just hearing the word for the first time, you have taken it upon yourself to educate the masses on social media, and I am grateful for it. Can you give us a little bit of an educational background on what adeno, the short abbreviation for the term, is? Sure, absolutely. So adenomyosis is a condition where the end endometrial lining, cells in the endometrial lining, so that lining that comes out when you have a period that sheds and comes out, those cells migrate from that inner lining into the muscle wall of the uterus, which causes a whole heap of symptoms, which we can get into shortly, um, because those cells still react to hormonal changes every single month. So they want to break down, bleed, but now that they're in the muscle wall, they have no route to exit the body. So it causes a heap of inflammation, pain, swelling, enlarges the uterus size overall. Um, and so it's similar to endometriosis, but not quite the same thing. And they don't always occur together. They can, but they're not, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. Great explanation because it's complex, just like all of these things we talk about endo, adeno, PCOS, they're not really in the forefront of health discussions, yet they impact so many people that are born with a uterus. What are some of the symptoms of adeno? So the symptoms, if you were to simply Google adeno, the most commonly cited symptoms are severe menstrual cramps, pain, abdominal pressure and pain, heavy periods, and infertility. Those generally are the sort of top four or five symptoms that are always cited, but it's that's doing it a disservice because it is so much more complex and wide and varied, and it varies from person to person. But the symptoms, as well as, you know, period pain, abdominal pain, you can get pain radiating down your legs, you can get pain in the sort of perineum area, um, area headaches, muscle aches, and then pain aside, you have heavy, very heavy menstrual bleeding, you can have clotting, you can have spotting between periods, you can have bladder symptoms, you can have bowel symptoms, um, but also psychological symptoms as well. You know, it's known to have a link with depression, with anxiety, mood swings, fatigue. You can have nausea. It is a whole host of not very pleasant symptoms. And it's not just as simple as calling it a pain condition. Mm -hmm. No, it's debilitating. And you live with the disease yourself, which is what brought you to being so passionate to to share the message um, for you. Can you just recap what happened and how you were able to get a diagnosis? Yeah, absolutely. So I always had very bad period pain, always, always. And I always had a lower abdominal swelling. And I just, I just thought that's what happens. Pain is subjective. I don't know what someone else's period pain feels like. Maybe I just feel it more or I'm more sensitive to it. Hmm. So from the age of about 13, 14, I was having those symptoms. But as I got a bit older and into my early 20s, I started to have a real kick up in the level of pain that I was feeling. But additionally, I was having quite severe bowel symptoms as well. Um, and so I went to GP and for years I was diagnosed with IBS. That's what, that's what the bowel symptoms are. That's it. But nothing was getting to the bottom of what the problem was. And I was misdiagnosed time and time again, pelvic inflammatory disease, kidney infections, cystitis, thrush, all these conditions that I didn't actually have. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thrush. Yeah, I was given 24 tubes of caniston, which is the anti-thrush treatment here in the UK. I don't know if it's the same over in America. Uh, yeah, without even having a physical exam, I was just handed <laughs> the biggest <laughs> prescription bag I've ever seen. Lo and behold, obviously it didn't help. And I eventually got um, got referred to a specialist, uh, a gyneco gynecological specialist, and they did an ultrasound, a transvaginal ultrasound. I'd had them before, mind you, but no one had picked up on anything. Hmm. But that one said I actually had very severe adenomyosis. And I had had them in the previous scans, but so few... Um, sonographers are actually trained to spot it in the first place. So it's like fighting an uphill battle and you even get the scan and sometimes are told there's nothing wrong. Yes. But it was a case of pushing for about 10 years. That's, yeah, it is. It's the, the misdiagnosis and the fact that you were taking drugs that you didn't even need 
and how that can cause an imbalance in your entire bodily ecosystem to begin with when you're already sick. And, and going back to with adenomyosis, there is no really easy way to discern it, to treat it. Um, and sometimes it doesn't show up on a scan. Um, now, the way that they do it from what I, again, not a medical professional, just to disclose that. But when they remove the uterus and they biopsy it, then they can find it. But I've even heard stories where someone will have adeno, but they can't get an accurate, um, an accurate diagnosis because they biopsied a piece of tissue that didn't have the adeno there. So there's so many gaps in our mm -hmm. medical diagnostic testing system, mm -hmm. let alone the healthcare system at large, that it's really the patient that's at a loss for trying to understand what's wrong with them. And even with your diagnosis, the to go back to the options to treat it are so limited. What are some of those options we currently have? So, so limited. So the go-to for someone who is still of reproductive age and wants children, the go-to is always some sort of hormonal treatment, be that the um, contraceptive pill, the hormonal coil, treatments along those lines to try and, it's basically putting a mask on the problem. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't cure you. It doesn't necessarily make the condition shrink. It, it can do, but not necessarily, but it masks those symptoms because you're suppressing your period. So if your predominant problem is period pain, that is one avenue that can help. The only cure that you're offered is a hysterectomy, which isn't a cure. That's that's not really what I would consider the word cure. Yes, officially it, will, it cures the problem, but that's not an option for the vast majority of people that are diagnosed with this no. condition. And there's also the side effects too. And I've, I've spoken to friends that have had hysterectomies for adenomyosis, and they have said that some of them have had wonderful outcomes and they feel better. Mm -hmm. Others, however, might also have a dual diagnosis with endometriosis, which as we know, endo is not cured by a hysterectomy. Yeah. But the scar tissue that can form from removing your uterus can be problematic in itself because anytime there is surgery, there is a possibility for adhesions and adhesions, depending upon how severe, can cause pain mm -hmm. um, and a, another host of issues. So there's, again, that isn't much of an option for people that are suffering. No, no. And there, there are some other treatments as well. There's uterine um artery embolization there is um which i'm again to preface this i'm not a medical expert yeah but it's where they sort of to my knowledge they they sort of cut off the pain signals that go through the nerves and then there's endometrial ablation um but that's not suitable if you still want children and right. it's the same story with the uterine artery embolization yeah. it, it carries a risk so to someone and to anecdotally use myself in this example i was diagnosed age 24 wasn't thinking about children yet, but knew I wanted them one day, you're given this list of options. And actually the common denominator is there's only one option, which is hormonal treatment and it doesn't cure and there's no guarantee it'll help. Right, right. no, and, and that's why we are here talking about it because there isn't a lot of information out there. It isn't discussed. This isn't something that someone necessarily is armed with when they go to the doctor and they say, I'm having heavy, painful bleeding. I'm having extreme bloating, which is also another sign of adeno. As you mentioned, the swelling comes on suddenly. It looks like you've had, you know, a few Thanksgiving meals. <laughs> you don't know why. Yeah. Um, I, that that one's the real kicker. Oh, it's uh, so The amount of so impressions you've had to unpop. <laughs> <laughs> need your bloat pants. Yeah. Um, but but to have the ability to at least discuss this as an option when you go into the doctor and say, "Hi, I think I might have this. Can you check for this?" And if they say, "Well, I've never heard of this before," you say, "Who do you know?" <laughs> who might be a better specialist, a better fit for me with my symptoms, because that comes into just having to navigate a landscape that is very difficult. Um, because as you mentioned earlier, sonographers are not necessarily trained to find this disease, let alone a patient who's just stumbling around in the dark, so to speak, trying to figure out what's wrong with them and already so vulnerable. And I find that to be more than frustrating, but just heartbreaking in itself. 
It, it really is. And I think you, you touched on a point there, which I think is really hitting the nail on the head is the knowledge just to know the words could make such a difference to so go into a doctor's appointment and say, I've got all these symptoms. Can we check for adenomyosis? Because, you know, general practitioners may not, it's not, it's not their specialist and it doesn't have to be, but they might not know about it themselves and it might not immediately occur because we're still one step behind with adenomyosis. Endometriosis is finally starting to have its true heyday. Now that's not perfect at all, but people have increasingly heard of that one. And I've noticed just over the years since I've been diagnosed that I go to a new general practitioner I've not seen before, they immediately know what they're talking about with endometriosis. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, totally thoroughly necessarily, but they do know. I'm still at a point that I'm going to a new general practitioner, I say adenomyosis, and you see that slight tick behind the eyes where you think, I don't think you know what I'm saying to you. <laughs> but I think to be able to go into a doctor and say, I've got these symptoms, they'll presumably say we can check for X, Y, Z, but to just add it to the list, the amount of people that would probably get an answer that wouldn't get it otherwise would be, you know, increased tenfold, I'd imagine. Yes, yes. And we are very close going to April, which is adenomyosis awareness month. And do you have any, any advice for those that are, and I would say suffering with any kind of pain right now and are feeling lost and unsure as someone who has navigated these very hard, <laughs> hard times and still are, um, what, what would you recommend to them? To be honest with you, what I'd recommend is to stop putting up with it. I think, and this is a sweeping generalization, but I think because of the way that medicine is at the minute, women kind of just deal with a lot of pain, a lot of symptoms, especially when it's in the pelvic region, because that's how we've been conditioned to believe and think, you know, women are the weaker sex, women complain loads, women cry loads, all these things that society perpetuates. I think whether or not you subscribe to it, and the majority of us wouldn't do, there's right. something in the back of your head that thinks, am I making too much of this pain? Am I whinging? Am I complaining too much? Whereas actually, we really need to try and shift this deep set, deep rooted belief that just because something's feeling wrong, it's fine, I can get on with it, I'll carry on being a career woman or being a great mum, being both, whatever it is that you do, actually going to someone and saying, no, this isn't right. And I know it's not right. I need to be checked out because we put it off for years. I'm so convinced of this. We, you know, we're feeling terrible and we still go to work. We still put a smile on, put our makeup on and get on with our day. And actually it's not okay. It's no. not okay. No, it's, you're, you're absolutely right. It's not okay. And we do know about the majority of illnesses, I would say this would probably go for any illness. The mm -hmm. sooner you intervene, yeah, the better you will be. Yeah. And, and your health matters because let's say you are someone who puts yourself on the bottom of the list mm -hmm. and everything else you, you value more importantly. Yeah. Without your health, you have nothing. Exactly. Everything exactly. else flips away too. So you're right, you have to prioritize. Exactly. And you know, this condition, it doesn't always, but this condition can progress. And the longer you put it off, the worse your symptoms may become, the worse your outlook for other areas, perhaps fertility could become. Mm -hmm. And I think, as I was saying before, you know, this societal idea that, you know, women just should should get on with it because they're always complaining, which I, I don't know. I don't know how many people still subscribe to that, but it is so prevalent, I think. You see memes about women on their periods and stereotyp stereotypical things. And it's just, it's, you put up with something because you think you have to and you don't, Right, you really don't. And if this April, someone watches this or comes across an adenomyosis post on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and can relate to some of it. I hope that it's the nudge that they need to go and get some answers and fight for themselves. Thank you. As always, so helpful and so kind. Thank you for your message. It's great no, to see you. Yeah, lovely to see you. Thank you so much for having me back. I really appreciate it. Anytime.